All right, we're back in the record. State of Florida versus Pablo Ebar, case number 9413062CF10B. Mr. Ebar is present with counsel, states present. For obvious reasons, no matter what the verdicts are, somebody's going to be very unhappy, somebody's going to be very happy. You have a right to be present during any kind of court proceeding unless you disrupt the proceeding. So if anybody cheers or claps or jeers or hisses or makes any noise or reacts physically in any way to the verdicts, you'll be immediately escorted out of the courtroom. State ready? Yes, sir. Defense ready? Yes, sir. All right, the verdicts are in legal order. The verdicts read as follows. In the circuit court of the 17th Judicial Circuit in and for Broward County, Florida, Judge Dennis D. Bailey, State of Florida, Plaintiff versus Pablo Manuel Ebar, defendant. Verdict count one. We the jury finds as follows as to count one in the charge of not known as Butch Casey to his friends. Around 2.30 this morning, Casimir Sukorowski was found murdered in his Miramar home along with two other people, Marie Rogers of Hollywood and Sharon Anderson of Miami. Police are saying little about what they found inside the house, except there was a lot of blood. They won't say how the victims were murdered or whether there are signs of forced entry. I've known about 13 years. 13 years. And I've known him to be a super really nice guy. And I know he has a lot of parties and friends and stuff like that, but I don't understand why this something like this would happen to a nice person like that. I just joined the newspaper a few months before the murders. It was just a whole different world back then. There were a lot of murders in Florida. All the way through, this is not how normal murder cases, the drugs, the sex, it was part of the story. And I think everyone got caught up on it. I think some of my stories looking back on them may have been a little too explicit. death notifications to the victim's parents or family um, after learning that their loved one had passed away, was killed violently. Um, that's the hardest part of my job. I would like to think I investigate cases very objectively. As a police officer, the evidence took me where it took me, and I followed that. And things were moved. 
This was very unusual for me. I've been assigned other homicides where it may have been two or three victims, but it was more drug-related. Uh, we really didn't know of a motive at this particular point. This was more senseless why this even happened. It was an execution. Possibly money, drugs, something specific that they may have been looking for. If there was a safe in his closet in his bedroom that was opened and things were removed. His black Mercedes was not there when we arrived. Obviously, somebody had taken his car. And then later on that day, we learned a black Mercedes that was burnt out in the field. But there were things on scene, like his necklace was gold, and rings and stuff that the ladies were wearing that they didn't take. So again, it may not have been jewelry or gold or, or anything like that. It was a long, grueling, complicated case, uh, but uh, it's a job. It's a job that I've been doing for over three decades. My name is Chuck Morton. I worked full-time for the Broward State Attorney's Office for 36 and a half years. No cost is too much for murders of this magnitude. And three people are brutally and viciously, cold-bloodedly executed and murdered and killed the way these three people were. We have an obligation to do whatever we can and spend whatever we can to bring to justice the people that commit these kinds of crimes. Mr. Sikorsky was a very security-conscious person, mainly because of the type of business he was in. Being in the bar business, being a rather flashy individual, with a lot of jewelry, known to carry a lot of money, uh, had access to a lot of material things. Sukarski carried guns. He used drugs openly. He had safes in his house that were full of drugs and money and guns when the police came in and found the, the bodies. He uh, was convicted of several drug cases. In fact, uh, was not permitted to own a nightclub because of these convictions. Casey's Nickelodeon, we found out, was in the name of someone else. This photo of Sukarowski was taken in 1987 when he was arrested by police on a charge of aggravated battery. He was best known as the owner of Casey's Nickelodeon, a popular restaurant and bar on Hallandale Beach Boulevard. It was, however, closed down by police for a time in 1983 because of drug activity. Tonight, it's closed again, shut down earlier in the day when news of his murder reached his employees. Yeah, it was a very popular club because it was one of those that stayed open later than usual. I've been to his club before, once or twice, but I, I didn't know him personally. It was the it place to be for a certain segment of the society. There'd be police officers and judges. Everyone was going to his club, and everyone knew what his club was. Sikorsky seemed like he would have been an interesting guy to know. I was probably around uh, 14 or 15, and um, I asked, expressed to my mother, I, I asked her if I could meet my father.
She began to understand how important it was for me to meet him and understand who he, who he is. And when I did go down there, he said, oh, you must be Brian. I said, yeah. And uh, we shook hands. It was just the first moment. I remember these phone calls at 6.30 in the morning. He would just be closing the bar up, so I'd get a phone call and he'd be like, hey, it's your old man, what are you, what are you doing? Hello? Yeah, this is the Fira. What are you doing? Well, what are you doing? <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Yeah. I'm depressed, I'm very depressed. What? What are you calling me so early for? Oh, man, oh, man, business is tough down here. Why don't you join your father down here and help me out? <laughs> business is, uh... Come on. This is your blood talking to you. You know, I don't, I don't want you with machine guns in hand, but, you know. We got a sense that something bad was going to happen to Casey. He expressed that on telephone conversations with his son, Brian. We just didn't know what it was. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you what was in his head, what he was trying to convey as far as what was going to happen. Here's the transcript right here. He didn't sound quite right. I mean, he sounded stressed, kind of upset. You know, right at that time, I, I didn't think about it. I didn't really drill into it any further. But sure, he's, he's asking for help, probably in a couple of, couple of different ways. Well, if in case anything ever happens to me, Ray is the executive of my state. No way. No, I said if anything ever happens to me. Really? Yeah. I, I'm not saying that anything is going to, but just in case. Yeah. So I don't know what's going to happen down here. There's serious battle with mobsters and all kinds of... You? Yeah. Uh oh But I got the guy, though. I got the guy. Yeah. Every phone call he made had been recorded. That gave police a real access into how he operated, what was going on in his mind, what he thought, how he talked about himself. It gave him an idea of his personality. I, can't, I cannot afford this rent. There is not going to be any increase because the next time you come in there with a chain and a rent, I'm going to be there, OK? Yeah, I cannot afford let me tell you something. No, no, I have to tell you, I cannot afford it. Let me tell you something. What? Don't go threatening me. I'm okay? not going to threaten you. I Don't promise. Don't go threatening me. What? You know, in the event that anything ever happens to me... You, you will. You'll get, you'll get two coffins, one for your money and one for yourself. I, you better believe it. You're always, you, you've always been that way and then you'll never, you'll never change. Sikorsky didn't deserve to get murdered, but at least he ran in those circles. These women just went to his house that night. They didn't do anything, and all of a sudden, they're tied up and murdered. I have had to spend 23 years reconciling my rational mind to my heart. There was so much pain. Hi, my name is Sharon Anderson. You have a wonderful day when you work out in the morning. You have a lot more energy. I was 
really very close to my sister because we were only 11 months apart. But we were, I don't think there was a day that went by that I did not talk to my sister. So when I got pregnant, I told her before I told my husband. That's how close we were. My mom called that Sunday. I remember I immediately got irritated because I thought, please don't call me in my ninth month pregnancy with the story about, you know, Sharon didn't call you. And maybe about nine or 10 o'clock that night, we both agreed, just, just call the police, right? That something's not right. In the meantime, mom tracked down Marie's mother and Marie's mother said, I thought that Marie was with Sharon. That's when everything changed. <laughs> But the next morning, we go to my husband's store. And I was sitting in the car, and his cell phone rang. And all he was saying is, yes, no, OK, yes, no, one word answers. So he hung up, and I said, I don't know why, but I said, just tell me, is she dead? So we went to the hospital. I had just toured that maternity unit two weeks before that. I didn't think it was going to be like that. So I knew nothing. I didn't know who was with her. We knew nothing. I later found out that Marie was dead and some guy named Butch Casey, name I never heard. So all I kept thinking is who would kill her? Broward County crime scene technician Bob Surratt, while he was doing his investigation, he went through all the rooms is when he saw the videotapes and said, I think you need to come see this. You don't even know it worked. Hmm? That's what I said, play it back. Give me that thing, eject that thing. Okay. <laughs> now I tell you people, whoever's going to watch this, should this man be institutionalized or what? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> crazy or what? Hundreds of hours of videotapes. Andy taped his own house. He taped the inside of his house. He taped his bedroom. He taped his sex acts with his girlfriend. In fact, the police noted that in 400 hours of videotape that they examined, it was difficult to find Sikorsky with clothes on. And then they found something that changed the entire case. Bob Surratt, he was observing the, I think it was the South Wall, uh, book shelving and stuff, and saw a video, not a video, but a VHS recorder, and he followed the line up, and lo and behold, placed up on top about eight feet uh, next to the ceiling was the camera. serious warning for you tonight. The video that we're about to share with you, which we've just received, is extremely graphic.
he showed me the tape. The whole video. All 27 plus minutes. Everything about that was completely normal until these guys enter. And then it's just hell. What kind of person kills three people for no reason in cold blood and walks out like they just turned off a light switch? Watch the video. They made sure they killed everybody in that house. So I got to watch two men blow a hole through the back of her head. And it was not instant. She suffered. Well, the most important evidence in the case is the videotape of the murder. You see what appeared to be a set of lights, vehicle lights, flash on a mirrored wall that he had in the living room. About 20 seconds later, you see the entry of two men, one wearing dark clothing, one wearing light clothing. They both enter. One has a hat and glasses on. The other one has a T-shirt wrapped around his head. Sharon Anderson gets up and runs into the bedroom, which was Casey's bedroom. Casey is then struck with the firearm. He falls to the ground. Marie Rogers is then pushed off her chair, and she lies still on the floor. There appears to be a question and answer period going on between Casey and the subject with the firearm, like he's being interrogated for answers. And every time he gives her the wrong answer, He's hit over the head, and that was done multiple times in the beginning. I had two people on video. They weren't on video. I was faced with the fact that I had two subjects on a video that I needed to identify. Those were the perpetrators who committed the crime of murder. Thirty-eight twenty. What was that? Yeah, a circular drive. He just had a small patch of grass and stuff inside. In the backyard is where the BSO deputy had gone and looked inside the back windows, and that's where he saw them laying down in the, um, in the living room area. What I can gather from the video that they came in from the um, from the right side, because you see on the video, he comes from this way. And I don't know if this gate or anything was the same or if it's changed or not, but they would have probably have come in through here. Around the side. And then here's where the the sliding glass, sliding glass door would be. This door, I, I believe at the time, um, was open. And of course, they were unaware that there was cameras in the house because it wasn't very visible to anyone until you know, we found it, only because we started moving things around, so. And we thought at this particular time, the best thing we'd do is to take a still photograph off the video, put it on flyers, and distribute them to local law enforcement to see whether or not these guys had a history. No one knew at that time, even with the stills, where those pictures came from. And that was the hardest part, was putting that name to those images. So we just continued to work the leads that were coming in from the general public, 
uh, law enforcement leads that may have had uh, similar instances that had occurred that suspects in that case. being given to Detective Paul Manzella of Miramar Police Department, bringing your attention back to uh, Sunday morning on the 26th of June, 1994. Oh, I left early to um, go to a bowling tournament. I left the house about 7.15, 7.20 in the morning. And uh, as I left, uh, I noticed a car pull out behind me. It was a convertible Mercedes SEL. And I know who owned the car. And I know I saw the two young white males pull out in it. I knew that they were not the owners. Well, basically, I saw two guys leave the house early in the morning. I didn't get a good look at one of them. He kind of turned away from me. But the other guy, I got a good look at him when he was getting in the car and when we were driving away from him. Mr. Foy came to the police and said, this is what I saw. I saw two young men in his car leaving his house in the early morning hours, and it happened to be very consistent with what the video saw. There's no way he could have known that unless he saw it. One guy, the driver, he tried not to look at me. I didn't get too good look at him, but the passenger, he looked hard at me, and I, I got a good look at him. Yeah, he described the passenger who he saw much better than the driver. He described him as a, um, a male, medium build, short crew cut type hair, shaved around the sides and the back. And he believed he was wearing a um, white shirt and had a scruffy face. Remember Gary Foy telling me that when he turned left onto Pembroke Road to go west, the Mercedes continued to go north on 64th Avenue. So this may be the same route that they took and that's where Gary Foy uh, left them, was at 64th and Pembroke Road. And he didn't see them after that.
Christopher Lincoln, and I'm 23 years old. All right, why don't you tell me what happened? We went up there, up, we put the people on the floor, and I stood there for the second. Everybody got, everybody got on the floor and put down, and all the time, everybody up, I just stood there. And all right. Stood. Now, who shot the dogs? The person with the Glock. Now, we call them. So the person who did the shooting had to have been Pablo. Pablo. We get a telephone call from Detective Sermon of the Miami-Dade County Homicide Division saying that, I think we have our guy. From Manzella's standpoint, this was a huge development. Not only did he have a man who looked a lot like the person in his flyers, he had a crime that looked a lot like his murders in Miramar. And Pablo Ibar being an organization that was involved in doing home invasions, there was a shootout with police on that particular scene. He had shot and killed the dog. To me, attitude and um, demeanor wasn't that of a squeaky clean kid. A lot of the conversation initially was an alibi. Where were you on such and such a date? Specifically, June 26, 1994. Who were you with? What were you doing? I then presented him a photograph that was taken from the scene. That was an excerpt of the video, a still photograph. And I presented it to him and I showed it to him. I says, Pablo, then how did I get this? And I showed him the photograph. And if actions could speak more than words, at that point, he pushes himself away from the table and just puts his head down. And at that point, he didn't want to talk to me anymore. Pablo Ibar. Angel. You have no funds to pay court costs, do you, sir? He's uh, your public defender representing you? You get private attorney or? Private attorney. Uh, so, and he's being held on a no bond capital offense. Uh, Mr. Morgan from the state attorney's Pardon? office is here. Uh, we have asked the court uh, not to disclose it to the public or have the clerk's office to dis disclose it to the public because it's still an ongoing investigation. There may be others involved. Uh, there are witnesses, perhaps, uh, whose names appear in that affidavit that whose lives could be jeopardized as a result of disclosing that, that affidavit at this time. Since it is a continuing investigation, I would ask the court not to rule on that. This is 7 News at 10 o'clock. Police insist that this is the gunman in 22-year-old Pablo Manuel Ibar. Se trata de Pablo Ibar, hijo de un pelotari, Cándido Ibar, y sobrino del boxeador Urtain. Está acusado de tres asesinatos, pero él asegura que es inocente. Pablo Ibar, que se ganaba la vida como pelotari de cesta punta en los frontones de la Florida. Sus orígenes familiares están en la localidad guipuzcoana de Cestón. Es sobrino del famoso boxeador Urtain, desaparecido trágicamente en Burgos. Pablo nació en Estados Unidos. Su padre se fue a América en los años 60 a probar fortuna. De repente llegó una llamada por teléfono pues, diciendo que Pablo fue arrestado, que se le estaba mezclando en el asesinato de esas tres personas. Entonces eh, no sabían ni, ni a qué lado actuaron ni, ni qué hacer. Es mi hijo y como hijo pues, habría que ayudar en todo lo posible, pero si yo supiera que él fuera culpable, que él lo ha hecho, mi actitud sería un poco diferente. Que como chico joven haya hecho alguna bobería o que la policía le haya parado, que le haya encontrado algo marihuana, todas esas cosas, uno pues, puede entender en la vida de aquí de Estados Unidos, pues es casi común. Pero cuestión de armamentos y eso, en nuestra casa nunca ha habido y yo en esas cosas ni creo ni, ni lo puedo creer. 
hasta los 11 años de él, pues la verdad fue un chaval muy simpático y muy querido de, de, de todos los amigos. 82, las cosas empezaron a torcerse, así le va a ir lleno el divorcio y esa separación pues fue un poquito más difícil para él también. I always looked up to my brother very much, wanted to be like him. Quería ser como él siempre, lo que hacía, mirándole siempre. I just, I love my brother to death, I always do. When he first was arrested, I couldn't believe it. I was living with my father in, in Connecticut, playing Highline, and um, I was down at that time for vacation for two weeks to visit with my mother and con mi hermano. I was with him every day, every other day. I couldn't believe then out of the blue the next the one of the days he's arrested. It was very shocking. And you never think at times that that's going to be the last time that you three are together on a trip like that. That that will never happen again. In Manzella's eyes, he was starting to solve his case. Manzella then had to make his case stronger. The first thing he did was take photos and show it to the only eyewitness he thought he had, Sikarski's neighbor, Gary Foy. Gary Foy, F-O-Y. Were you able to identify anyone in that particular photograph to depict the same as the person that was occupying that Mercedes Benz back on the 26th of June, 1994? Well, there's six possible <coughs> people here. <clears throat> Four I eliminated, I didn't think were at all. And then... It's Which a, numbers did you eliminate? Uh, two, three, four, and six. And the two that I think resemble it are one and five. And five looks more like him, but... If you were to be presented with a live lineup, mm -hmm. do you think you might be able to identify the person that you recalled to be in the um, Mercedes-Benz at the time? It could be possible. I can't say definitely, I just have to see it. As they were being escorted from the library down the hall into the room, Gary Foy taps me on the shoulder, that's him, that's him, and pointed Pablo Ibar out. There's one positive identification of a uh, shoe print. It was a property of Francisco Rancon, and it was a left shoe of submitted footwear has the outer sole design consistent with the impression noted in number one above and could have been the footwear that made the impression. That had sole prints that were almost identical or very similar to the sole prints that were left in blood at, at the crime scene. And those shoe sizes were the same size shoes that Pablo Ibar wears. And the one with the unique basketball player on it. See, there's the hands, there's the basketball player. found the t-shirt that was collected into evidence and it was possibly used as head cover for Pablo Ibar. The t-shirt was on the uh, front stoop area over by the front door and that was uh, something that we've collected because apparently Pablo Ibar had wrapped his head in a t-shirt when first entering. And then after all the bodies were on the floor and were shot, Pablo removed that as he was coming out the door here. So, but that was left behind and we, we did recover that. 
The shirt itself had like some kind of an electric company logo on it that it turned out the mother is either worked for them, was friends with them, familiar with them, but there was a connection between the mother and that electrical company that of the shirt that we found at the front of the door. So again, it's another piece of the puzzle that would, you know, lean towards Pablo Ibar. I think it's this house right here, the corner house. That corner house right there, 6391. All of the people living at the Lee Street address had criminal pasts for drugs, narcotics, weapons violations. They like to live a life of ladies and late nights and having nice cars or fast cars. And in South Florida, that means having a weapon. In fact, a brochure of the type of weapon that was used in this case was found in Mr. Ebar's home where he lived during the course of the murder. So this was good for Manzella. He had one man, but it didn't answer the question, who was the other person in the video? So he started interviewing Pablo's friends. They had known each other for a long time, although they went to different high schools and even were members of different gangs at one point in their lives. Gene Klemetschko was a kid with a problem. He was addicted to drugs, had been in and out of jail, and needed a place to stay. Pablo offered his home on Lee Street. The weekend of the 26th, that being a Sunday, go back to the 24th being a Friday. Did you go anywhere in particular that evening Friday? No, uh, you know, we went to Casey Nickelodeon. And who did you go into Casey's with? Pablo Seth. OK, who's Seth? Seth Penalver was part of the group of friends that lived in Lee Street along with Racon and Pablo. Unlike Pablo, Seth did have a criminal history. He had been arrested in the 1990s on weapons charges. What about Saturday evening for Sunday morning? Do you remember where you were? I stayed, I stayed at the house that night, though. OK, and you said that Pablo came back? Yeah, Pablo and Seth came back. At what time was that? Early that morning, about 7 o'clock. They, they, they were acting real funny and stuff. Kind of paranoid, whatever, and then they probably, I thought they were high on powder, or cocaine, whatever. And then I saw a black car, a dark colored car, a newer car. I think it was a convertible. Okay. All right, Seth Penalver, uh, your attorney's here. He's up at the podium. I'm going to read you the charges and then let him speak. Uh, count one is murder, first degree. Police insist that this is the gunman in the dark clothes who struck that blow, 21-year-old Seth Manolo Penalva, and that the second gunman in white is 22-year-old Pablo Manuel Ibar. For Ibar's former roommate, there is no question. Were you sure right away that that was Pablo on that tape? Yeah, someone you hang out with, you know what I'm saying, and you see them on tape. Shocking. It was a startling piece of video shown before Judge Charles Green as part of a preliminary hearing for defendant Seth Penalver, who was joined in court by the second defendant, Pablo Ibar. Miramar police are convinced they are the two men who burst into the home with semi-automatic weapons. Eventually, all three victims would be shot to death. No prosecutor, no one wants to convict someone who is innocent. We can only go by the evidence that's presented to us and our conclusions and inferences drawn from that evidence. And nor that I have any other evidence to lead me in any other direction. 
that would convince me that I had the wrong person. It wasn't a closed case. Clearly in those cases where people commit very heinous or atrocious or cold and very calculated murders, I do believe, personally feel that the death penalty is appropriate. I told my sister the day she died, I will never let this go. Not ever. From the day she died to the day I'm sitting in an execution room, I'm never gonna let it go. I got a much of this. No, no, much of this. I said, yeah, well. Nadie sale de la senda. Está encerrado 24 horas al día. Te deja bañar tres veces a la semana. No se puede llamar a la familia. No se puede comunicarse, comunicarse con nadie. El, el julio de este año va a tener 17 años preso para un crimen que no hice. Yo tengo esperanza en Dios. Yo sé que un día yo voy a salir de aquí. Él sabe que yo no lo hice. Bueno, le quiero dar la bienvenida a una persona que ustedes no conocen, que va a estar a oscuras porque ha dado un paso sumamente valiente e importante que podría ayudarnos a todos, empezando por este programa, a salvarle la vida a un muchacho que se llama Pablo Ibar. Juan, que asegura conocer al hombre que verdaderamente cometió el crimen. ¿Qué es lo que lo impulsa a llamar al programa Nuestra Producción? Bueno, lo que me impulsa a llamar al programa es que yo estaba viendo el programa y estaba oyendo que iban a, a, a dar el caso de la persona que mataron en Hallander y la 56, y que iba a entrevistar al, al asesino, ¿no? Y sale la, supuestamente la persona que asesino, pero aquí hay un error, esto no fue el que mató a esa persona. El que mató a esa persona fue Willy. Y en ese momento oh. llamé a mi esposa y le dije, mira, ponte a ver el televisor y cuando salga la persona que está en el video, que se quite la, el pulóver de la cabeza, dime quién es. Y cuando él viene, que se quite el pulóver, que varias veces pasó, que se lo quite, y dice, señora mía, ahí no cabe duda, ese es Willy. Y yo le entonces, ¿por qué están acusando a esta persona si esta persona no ha hecho nada? El asesino fue Willy, él me lo confió, me dio detalles, lo que estoy viendo en televisor, en el video, es lo mismo que él me contó. Que no sabe a dónde una cámara lo había grabado más, que la cara le estaba saliendo y, y que en cualquier momento lo arrestaba. Creo que debe pagar la persona que es culpable del asesinato, no un inocente. A mi entender, el Pablo es inocente completamente. 